<laughs> Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I bet witness that there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is a messenger. I want you to stand on stay on your feet. I mean, I was asked to bring the minister on. I've been to the minister all over the world. I never had this opportunity to bring him on. So look, I thank I, I thank Master Farad Muhammad, I thank the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I thank the Honorable Louis Farrakhan for the opportunity to serve. But I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of them for my beautiful wife and family, Sister Stephanie Muhammad. Praise be to Allah. So let's bring on the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Only way I know how, here he is, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and we give him thanks for his blessings and his mercy to the human family. The greatest of God's mercies is that whenever any segment of the human family strays, from his path. Out of his mercy, he always raises from among them a prophet or a messenger to guide them back to his straight path that they might once again come into his divine favor. This is why, as Muslims, and that word Muslim only means one who believes in submitting his or her entire will to do the will of God. That's all it means. And it is not a religion that you convert to. It is the nature of God and it is the nature in which we all are created. All of us are created to submit, to do the will of God. We get other than that by the way we are trained or the way we are taught. And that's why the Bible teaches, train up the child in the way it should go. And when it is old, it will not depart from that way. It means train up the children in the nature of themselves and in the nature of God. And as you cannot get a lion to go out of its nature after it has grown in its nature, nor can you get any creature to act out of its nature after it is grown in its nature, then you will never get a child that is trained up in its nature to go out of that nature when it is grown. We thank Allah always for all of his prophets and all of his messengers, and we make no distinction between them. All prophets, all messengers come from one eternal source. 
They are all part of one great family. And though they appear in many different parts of the earth, and God always raises one from among the people that speaks the language of that people, yet the revelation that he gives to that prophet to give to his people is contemporary in that it has solutions to contemporary problems. But the basis of that revelation are unchanging, immutable laws that you can find in the teaching of every prophet, of every messenger that ever appeared anywhere on our planet. And that's why as Muslims we believe in Moses and we believe in the Torah or the Old Testament as it is commonly called. We believe in Jesus and the Injil or the Gospel or the Good News. And we believe in Muhammad and the Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I come before you as a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And if I live to be a thousand, I could never thank Allah enough for the day that I heard his voice and heard his teachings and decided to become one of his followers. That was 50 years ago. <laughs> and he taught me and taught us out of the Torah or Old Testament, out of the Gospel or New Testament, and out of the Holy Quran. And he taught us to study the religions, all of them, because you cannot speak to people except you know the language of the revelation that God brought to them. And the reason that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was called a universal prophet is because he spoke the language of the revelation of God to every prophet that came on this planet at any time, anywhere, among any people. And he came with a book that would unite the whole of humanity if that book were properly taught and properly represented. Unfortunately, religion has been the most divisive of all uh, teachings and it has created more havoc among the people of the planet than any other teaching. More hatred and more murder under religion. It is not because the people are bad. It's because the people are ignorant and they don't see the common thread that would unite all humanity. And that's why the New Testament says there will be one God one faith and one baptism. So in the end of this drama, God would speak to humanity through a people who were no people at all, through a foolish people that he would claim to be his people and he would raise them up and they would call to humanity and bring humanity to the oneness of God. And to my beloved Muslim family, it is not an accident that Bilal, the first muezzin or caller to prayer, was an Ethiopian, an African, a black man, who stood by the side of Muhammad, a white man. And there was brotherhood between them. And Muhammad 
the, 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 the writers call him fair skinned. I don't know what fair means, you know. Does it mean that his skin was more just or more fair or more equitable? I don't think so. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in some of his last lectures among us, he said that Prophet Muhammad was white. And that was a signal. That was a signal. He was the most noble of human beings. He was the most noble in character. And he was found fit to be this, uh, the recipient of the last revelation that would come to this world. But he was a sign of one that would come at the end of this world who would say, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And as the black man is the original man, he was the first, he is the last. And therefore, when that one comes into the world, he says, before Abraham was, I am. I thank Allah for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, a white looking man <laughs> whose companion was definitely a black man from Georgia, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> This might be shocking, you know, to some. But Bilal was the caller to prayer. And you, a black people, destroyed, robbed and spoiled, are chosen by God to call humanity out of its madness to the oneness of God. Uh, just look at this. You know, Bilal had a beautiful voice, they say. And the prophet loved to hear Bilal make that call. In fact, the whole call to prayer came not from other sources, but it came from Bilal. And it is believed that Allah revealed it to Bilal. And it goes like this. These are the words. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Four times, God is great. I heard a wonderful Christian pastor the other day as I was turning my television uh, dial, not the dial, but the, the remote. And... Uh, the choir was singing, God is great. See, we all speak the same language, but when we're missing each other, you know. And today, I don't want us to miss each other. I want us to understand each other, because only through understanding can we come together as one great people under God. So the first thing that Bilal did he raised his hands like this and said, Allahu Akbar, God is great. And as I looked at that, it reminded me of surrender. Come out with your hands up. 
And when somebody got you and they say, come out with your hands up, that means I ain't hiding nothing. I ain't got nothing. I ain't trying to offer no resistance. Hey, 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 God, you great. Not me. I've been fighting you all my life, doing it my way, messing up my life and the life of others. But I am tired of fighting you, God. I throw up my hands. I yield and surrender. And I say, God is great. And then he goes on to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is no God but the one God who created the heavens and the earth, whose proper name is Allah. And then he says that twice. And then he says, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God and he's the door through which I came into the knowledge of the one God. And then it says, Hayya Allah Salah, come to prayer. Now that you've surrendered, Bow down. The Bible says in that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Come to prayer. If my people, Second Chronicles said, if my people which are called by my name First thing, will what? Humble themselves and bow down and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Come to prayer. It's an invitation, not with force of arms, not with bombs strapped on your body, not killing innocent men, women, and children for political purposes. It is a call with the human voice, not with arms. Hayya ala salat. Come to prayer. Hayya ala al falah. Come to the cultivation that leads to success. The word falah, the Arabic falah and falahin is a farmer. See? I'm going right from the Quran or the call to the Bible. It says, in that day, we shall beat our swords and our spears into what? Plowshares and pruning hooks. So we're not going to study war no more, but we'll be in the business, not just in cultivating the earth, but we will be cultivating the spirit of God in human beings so that everywhere we look, we will see God manifested in women, God manifested in men, God manifested in children. And then and only then, we will be living in the hereafter when the prayer that we were taught as children our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be 
done where? On earth, even as it is in heaven. And when God's will is practiced on earth, there'll be no more war, no more revolution, no more hatred, no more strife, no more sickness, no more disease, and we will be living and operating on an elevated plane. See, you're not living on that plane yet, but when that wisdom comes and you take on wings, not physical wings, but spiritual wings, coming back to the Bible, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. That you will exist on the same plane that I exist on. And where do you exist, Messiah? I am at the right hand of God. So this Messiah wants to raise our thinking that we will be reflections of Allah justifying the wearing of his names. I didn't come to say that. Yeah. Yes. Come to cultivation. You know, brothers and sisters, you are the people of God. Some of my Muslim brothers, scholars, don't want to say that human beings have a divine essence. because they want us to get away from the worship of human beings. But these scholars are mistaken. Allah created the heavens and the earth and all of the heavens and the earth glorify him bear witness to him. Therefore, the creation is divine. Because it didn't come from anybody but the divine creator. The sun is divine but not worthy of worship. Some of the ignorant saw the sun. It was so magnificent they worshipped it. Some worship moon and stars. Some Worship snakes and trees and whatnot because of the majesty of the creation. But the Quran teaches us that in everything that Allah created, in it there is a lesson for man if man would be mindful. So you are born into a universal book. This is God's library. And the more you study what God has created and understand why he created it, you become wise. And that's why the Bible says, O oh, thou sluggard, go to the ant, study its ways, and become wise. My dear brothers and sisters, that is why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is so valuable as a teacher. 
because he is among us to feed the essence of God within us that we may grow into reflections of our Creator. It's not about entertainment. It's not about the use of force. It is about the appeal to the God nature in you. Even though you want to deny its existence, the teacher must know that the God essence exists in the human being, and even though they come at you in an ignorant way, keep on pulling for the God essence that is within, and slowly but surely, you will quicken that person to spiritual life. Now, what I wanted to talk about today, I guess that was the, the introduction. But what I wanted to talk about is it's a spiritual subject. Um, but while I was thinking on you last night, and very early this morning, the thought came to me of the 29th surah of the Quran, the spider. Now, the spider is an interesting creature. It spins a web, and lightweight creatures lightweight creatures get caught in its web. And when I first studied this, the spider, after the fly or another insect gets caught in the web, the spider comes out from wherever it is on the web because it travels very quickly in that web to its meal. And it sticks uh, it's uh, yeah, it's like a straw, but it sticks this thing into the fly, and from that comes enzymes into the internal um, organ or workings of the fly and breaks it down into a liquid. And then the spider sucks up the inside of the fly, leaving only the, the form. But it's no longer what it was. And if the fly doesn't get out of the trap, Within three seconds, it becomes a meal. So the three is important. How many days did Jesus descend into hell? But on the third day, he arose. Peter. I know, but before the cock crows, once, you will deny me thrice. But don't worry, after the third denial, you're up. You're coming back home. Now, this spider spins the web from itself. So many of us have a saying, it's not the man, it's the plan. It's not the white man, it's the system. But the system came from a man. 
So don't ever say it's not the man, it's the plan. The plan came out of a man. Now we used to sing a song in church. The devil is mad and I'm so glad because <laughs> he missed the soul. The soul that he thought he had. Now the enemy of God is always working to trap you. Not just you, me, us. And once he gets you in the web of his machination or scheme or plan, he moves quickly to you to inject you with a word that has a function like the enzyme that breaks down your spiritual form. Listen, listen. See, so many of you, you're really good people no matter how ugly or bad you act. You're really good at the core. But you get trapped. And what traps you? What tricks you? What grabs you that allows Satan to get a hold on you. He comes after you in your own desires. I'm a beautiful young woman, she says, but I don't have a man. She says, so I'm looking hard, but I may not know what I'm looking for, but I know it's a man. See, Satan always appears in the form of what you desire. And so does God. Quran, I'm quoting now. And God said to Mary, and you shall conceive, and it will be a man child, and he will be a prophet. She said, but how can I? when a man has not yet touched me. And Allah said, that is easy for me. All I have to say is be, and it is. And in another part of the Quran it says, and we sent her our spirit, and it appeared unto her in the form of a well-made Man. So if God can send his spirit to fulfill the desire of a righteous woman, then the enemy can send his spirit in the form of a man to fulfill negative purposes for your life. And this is why the Bible says you have to become wise to be able to discern the spirit. <laughs> because the outward look is not important. It's the spirit that you must discern because Satan, the book says, 
is able to transform himself into an angel of light. Well now, if Satan can do that, then he or she can appear to you in whatever form will please you. I am a singer of songs, a writer of music, but I need a publisher. I need an agent. I need a manager. I'm a beautiful young lady. I have a nice form. I'm tall and I'm thin, and I would like to be a model. Well, you're looking for somebody now to help you fulfill your desire. I'm a mathematician. I'm an engineer. I just graduated from Morehouse, and I'm ready for a job. Satan can come as an employer. You know, I've been looking at my TV, and I saw a beautiful uh, 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 Mitsubishi, or beautiful BMW, beautiful Mercedes, beautiful Cadillac. Now you want something. Now the question is, how do you get what you want, and at what price? How do you get what you want, and at what price? Now, see, when Satan is after you, you got to give up something. Here's a young man, his young lady, she's a virgin. She meets a nice young man on the campus. And she likes him, she's attracted to him, he's attracted to her. But look, you know, so many girls are, are attracted to me, sister. Uh, what, are you going to give it up? Because I ain't got no time to waste on a girl that ain't giving it up. Oh my God, I'm thrown into a dilemma. I like that boy, but well, I'll disappoint my mommy and my daddy. Oh, but damn, I mean, <clears throat> I think about it. See, now you think that that young man is your friend, but he's spinning a web. And just reverse it. Sometimes you see you want a woman. See, but the web starts spinning. You say you're a Muslim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, brother, bring that paper. What's the name of that paper? The Final Call? Well, well honey, I'm calling. And if you respond, it just might be your final call. You just come out of college. You, you go back and you see your friends. They're happy to see you. You clean. You want to celebrate. Hey, man. And this is your buddy. You grew up with him. He didn't go to college. He, he's still on the corner. You left him on the corner. You find him on the corner. But he got an eight ball in his pocket. Uh, how you doing, man? Look, I know, I know you got your degree, man. Congratulations, brother. <laughs> but look, uh, I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm going to get high. And I want you to try this with me. It ain't going to hurt you, man. It ain't going to do nothing. You're just going to feel real good. See? Now, that's your friend. You grew up with, that's your buddy. You went to school together. But here comes Satan. In the form of your friend. 
spinning a web. You may have three minutes to say, no, thank you, brother. I'll, I'll see you at another time. No, thank you, my friend. I, I'll see you at another time. See, don't tell me that you want to be righteous hanging out with people who don't want what is right. If you want to be right, hang out with those who want right and you'll stay right. But if you hang out with the wicked, it won't be long before the spider has spun its web. And then with a few words, they break you down. Your resistance is gone. See, that's what happens to virgins. Their resistance break down, but it starts from within. It's an urge. You know, you're natural. You're a natural young lady. You're a natural young man. I, I, I feel these hormones, they, they, you know, they, 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 they fired up. Damn, I want to try this thing. But I'm scared. Well, see, maybe... Maybe uh, 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 I'll get pregnant. Well, I met a nice young lady. She's my friend, too. And she wants me to try sex. But I know I won't get pregnant with her. <laughs> Spinning the web. And you end up in a lesbian relationship. You're safe. You can't come home pregnant. But you're broken down on the inside now. And the natural is becoming unnatural. Jesus, the greatest of the prophets, well, yes, greatest of the prophets, because as Messiah, he's greater than a prophet. If you study the Quran carefully, the Messiah did things that prophets don't generally do. He made the blind see by God's permission. He made the deaf hear by God's permission. He raised the dead to life by God's permission. Those are Allah's attributes. So when a human being is doing what only God can do, then God is present in that human being working through that human being greater than a prophet. See, look, look, look. A prophet speaks of God in the absence of God. The Messiah is not only speaking of God, but God is present. That's why the Emmanuel, God is with us. Present. That's a big difference. Big difference. So, Jesus was a king, but he didn't have no kingdom. Not yet. See? Now, if Jesus was so beloved of God, but he had to be tried, then how can you escape? How can I escape? How can we escape? Satan walked right up to Jesus. Hey, come on. Come on up on this mountain with me. Take a walk with me. See? You got to walk with your trial. Come on up on the mountain with me. Look out over there. Look at all those cities, Jesus. 
I'm master over those cities. Jesus said in his mind, yeah, temporarily. <coughs> he said, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all of that. Jesus, in his mind, said, yeah, it's coming to me anyway. I'm just going to wait on my father. Then he said, get thee behind me, Satan. See, now, some of us want things so bad that we compromise things of value to get something that is in our minds very valuable but less valuable than what you gave up. See, a fair exchange is when you give up something to get something equal to what you gave up. But when you give up principle and then lose your soul in the process, then whatever you get in that transaction does not benefit you. It could be a beautiful home, but you won't have any peace in it. It could be a nice car. It could be the man that you thought was the man of your dreams or the woman that you thought was the one you were looking for all your life. But if you have to compromise your principles to hold on to nothing and give up virtue for nothing, then you don't rejoice in the bargain that you made that day. But Allah says in the Quran, rejoice in the bargain that you have made this day. For I have given you the garden in exchange for your lives. Ooh. Then the God says, rejoice in that bargain because your life was worthless. But I ask you to give me your worthless life. And in the place of that, I will give you the paradise. So when you make that bargain, that bargain gives you joy. Now, why did this subject come to me in the middle of the night for you? I can't answer. All I know is that that's what I was supposed to begin to talk on to you. And each one of you know in your own heart why I'm saying what I'm saying. Okay. No. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back at all. I'm a brother like you, struggling like you to be and live up to my word that I gave to Allah and his messenger, that my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death is all for God. I said that 50 years ago, and I'm still striving to make my word my bond. So I am locked in struggle just like you. But when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad asked me to make the national broadcast during his time among us and for six years I did it for the first three years I wrote every word and some of the brothers in this room 
were with me in those early days when I would write every word, weigh every word, and bring a 29 minute, 30 second broadcast. But after doing that for three years, I, I was with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad one day, and he said, oh, brother, you don't have to do that. Just go stand up and let God speak through you. Now, I didn't come before you with any notes. I just asked brother for the Holy Quran. And I've been talking to you now for about 35 or 40 minutes. And everyone in this audience already knows that there was something you were looking for, something you needed, and something you received. Now, I am grateful to Allah to be used as an instrument. I am not puffed up with pride or arrogance because I know I'm just a servant. I'll be here for a short time and then I'm gone the way of all flesh. But while I'm here, I'm honored to be his servant and to help you and our people and humanity see the greatness of God and the greatness of yourselves when you are in submission to God. Now, I'm going to continue with this subject and I'm going to read now from the Holy Quran, but this is going to reinforce what you heard that may have touched you personally because it's all designed to heal you. It's all designed to strengthen you. It's all designed to make you what you know you already are, a better person, but not living in your dreams, manifesting your greatness by your surrender to your creator. Okay. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told me one day, and some in this audience can bear witness that they've heard him say this, that the FBI was looking for him because Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor and they wanted to arrest Elijah Muhammad because they could not afford to have this man on the street preaching to black people while America was trying to prosecute a war because they have always wanted to use you in wartime and at election time. At any other time, do the best you can. So Elijah Muhammad, they had come for him. I think he said he was in Baltimore. And the enemy got to where he was. And he said he walked down the stairs right past them. That's right. And they saw him and didn't see him. Like the time that I was overseas. on a world tour mm -hmm. and they had said that anybody that visited or talked to or did any business with Muammar Gaddafi should be arrested and put in jail for 10 years. And I had a vision of what they were going to do to Brother Gaddafi so I didn't care what they said. I got on a plane with Brother Sharif, That's right. 
Brother Salim yes, sir. and Brother uh, Sheikh uh, Tijani and Rufai. And we got on a jet, and a Russian jet, and flew to Tripoli, Libya, to warn Brother Gaddafi of what America was planning. The Secretary of State was George Shultz. And I think the, um, the, uh, uh, the attorney, attorney general, what was his name at that time? I, I can't remember, but he's the one that said Farrakhan should go to jail. So somebody, while I was overseas, sent me a document that they would be watching me at ev for, for me at every port of entrance into America. And I got in, walked right past them, walked past them. And was in the country nearly a week before anybody outside of my family and Brother Akbar knew that I was back in the country. So when God wants to hide you, he can hide you in the open. So the messenger said he walked right by them and he got on a train going toward Philadelphia. And you know, a beautiful sound on a train is the tracks. And he said, while the sound of the tracks was coming up in his ear, he heard the voice of Master Farad Muhammad saying to him, quote, do men think that they will be left alone on saying we believe and will not be tried? And indeed, we tried those before them, so Allah will certainly know those who are true, and he will know the liars. Now, that's all that he heard, but it was enough. When he got to Philadelphia, he made up his mind. He knew he was being tried, so he was going to go back and face his trial. Yeah. And now they have a picture of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in handcuffs between two FBI agents being taken away to prison by order of President Roosevelt. It was an executive order signed that he had to go. Now, we may face something like that today. Because the war that is going on now is going to get deeper and wider. And my voice and the voice of others, they will try to silence. Though I am not afraid of any of that. That, that, that does not bother me if the president signs an executive order saying Farrakhan has to be arrested well that's what he said we'll, we'll just see how that plays out my point is no one who believes in God can escape being tried. Now, trials are like tests. How well did you study? Some of us don't study, and we take tests and we pass because we paid attention in class, though we didn't read the book too well. I was like that. I didn't even buy a book when I was in school. This is the truth. I never bought a book all the years I was in college. 
<coughs> never. <coughs> I just went to class. If I wanted to pay attention, I did. And I could listen well, recall well, and put down what I recalled, and I passed when I wanted to pass. Got A when I wanted to get an A. And didn't give a skip if I didn't get it. You know what I mean? I'm just that kind of fella. But tests show up weakness. In order for God to perfect his creation, he must manifest its weakness. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad are called this time the time of the manifestation of defects. Now, if you come up with something that is your creation, how do you know that it works until you test it? And when you test it, oh, oh well, I got to fix that. I got to shore this up. I got to do that. Well, that is so it is with God. He wants to perfect us so that he can use us for the redemption of our people and all of humanity. So we've got to be tried and our defects manifested in order for us to be perfected. Now, when you come into a place like the mosque, sometimes it can be very difficult. Not sometimes. Imagine sitting next to somebody and you see boils pop out all over them and you look horrified at them because you haven't seen the mirror. <laughs> boils popping out all over you. And sometimes the mosque can be an unbearable place because the activity of the mosque and the workings of God is bringing out of you stuff that you didn't even know was in you. So you sitting next to somebody and all of a sudden, Bleh! damn, in my lap. See, this is all in your Bible if you read it. See, Jesus' work was the work of casting out demons. And, and, and look, <laughs> brother, sister, we got them. Go behind that smile and <laughs> I still love Selakum. Oh, a lot of demons up under that now. But as we interact with the word and interact with each other and interact with the program and interact with laborers and officials, see, then stuff start coming up. Stuff start coming out. You say, well, maybe I don't belong here. See? You run away. And you look in the mirror, and you don't see your boils. Because now you're not in an environment to bring out what's in. You melt into the poisoned environment of the world. And you become like what you've melted into. So the web was spun. Because you could not take the process of cleaning up. Listen to me good now. See, you can be a funky person on the outside. On the inside, you can be funky, but you can't stay funky because there's something here to clean funk, wash funk. 
So when you smell your brother, check under your arm. God is working on us. And if you don't stay in the process, you won't see the result of being made into him. Do men think that they will be left alone on saying we believe and will not be tried while others were tried before you? So expect a trial. <laughs> Look for a trial. Because Allah says in the Quran, He will try the believers at least once a year severely. Now, how will he try me? How? See, sometimes if you know what's on the test, somebody gave you the test in advance, you know, one of your friends or your buddies, and you just look at your hand, you wrote it down. And you pass the test. Not with God. He comes at you and me in a way that we least expect. And guess what? You can't be tried except by what you love. You can't be tried except by what you desire. Now let's look. Allah says in the Quran, Surely I am going to try you. This is God talking to Muhammad. I'm going to try you with something of fear. That's the first thing. Fear. Mm. Hunger. Loss of property. Loss of life. Diminution of fruit. But give good news to those who are patient and steadfast under trial. But the good news only comes after You've been tested. Then the Quran says, after difficulty comes ease. And then in another place it says, with difficulty comes ease. Now let's look at this. You know, we taught that the white man is the devil, you know. Well, he's been a real devil. No question about that. You don't need to find nothing under the ground that could do any worse to you than what the white man has done to you on top of the ground. You know, that's real. But I was asked to go to the John Jay School of Criminal Justice in New York and deliver a lecture. And there I went. I fixed my subject up real nice, you know, wrote it out real clear, didn't want to offend nobody, so I stayed in what we call the safe zone. When I finished my lecture, a white, uh, he may have been a detective because he wasn't in uniform, he got up, he opened his coat, he threw it back, there was a big piece on his side. And he looked at me. He said, I hear that you all teach that the white man is the devil. Is that so? 
this was my heart. <laughs> now, I'm being very honest with you. See, fear is what challenges you, but we have to challenge our fear. And if you challenge your fear, it will leave, and the thing that you were afraid of becomes afraid of you. Now watch this, watch this. This is my heart. Now I can either punk out and say, well, he, he, he used to teach that. He, he don't teach that no more. <laughs> or I could slickeration it, but I would have lost and compromised what I believe. So I, in that circumstance, had to challenge my fear. And I said, yes, sir, he does teach that the white man is the devil, and this is why. Now, <laughs> the minute I said that, and I started to go on into the history with us, so help me God. That man had the gun on his hip, but he threw up his hand. He said, all right, I understand. I understand. Fear was taken off of me. And God put fear in him because the truth. Wait a minute. The truth was convicting him. And a man having the courage to speak it frightened him. So when they said we ought to bring the minister before Congress, I said, don't threaten me. Do it. Somebody told me, those are some of the wisest men. I said, but they ain't God. <laughs> so when you become afraid, and it will make you compromise yourself, challenge your fear to hold on to your principle, and God will strengthen you and reward you with victory. See? But if you allow yourself to be made afraid, then they punk you. Excuse my use of the language. But I mean what I say, punk you. Because the enemy always is trying to punk you to offer you an advantage. Deny him. And I will give you this. Deny him. And I will give you that. Then you got a way. Do you want that more than you want? The strength of your own soul? Do you want to be like that fly? That looks like a fly on the outside. But all that made it a fly is gone from the inside. Muslims, Christians, nationalists, revolutionaries, all will be tried. And the enemy wants to know 
Are you really sincere in what it is that you profess? And he'll keep on sifting you until he finds your weakness. And that's the door through which he comes in to take your soul. I'll try you with something of fear, hunger. Have you ever been hungry? See, as Muslims, we fast so we understand or know something about what hunger is. We put it on ourselves because, you know, the man in, in the book gave up his birthright because he got hungry. Gave up his birthright over some porridge. You don't know what you do. That's why big talk. I mean, you know, it, it's, it sounds good. It attracts the crowd. I mean, all that sounds good. But when the trial comes, if you still are woo, 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 then that's who you are. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> but if when the trial comes, woo, 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 turn to meow. <laughs> All right, brother. I got you. You're looking at 10 years. You go back to the mosque. And tell me everything that they're doing. You go back to the mosque. And get around the minister and act like you his security. Go back to the mosque. I'll give you so much every week. Saddam Hussein used to work for the CIA. Noriega used to work for the CIA. President Jim of Viet South Vietnam worked for the CIA. Mobutu worked for the CIA. But when the enemy get finished using you, he turns you right back to the people that you betrayed. Because the enemy don't like a punk. Did you hear me? If you will be a snitch and work against your own people's rise to get out of doing time, he don't have no respect for you. And he'll use you till he use you up. Take a pretty woman from college. Send her in. Get next to the minister. Be real sexy around him. You know, you know what I mean. See if he'll bite the bait. When you get him, report back to us. And we'll start filming him. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Satan calling. <laughs> I don't know who that was. I was just making a point. <laughs> but in the middle of what God is trying to tell you, Satan will give you a call. <laughs> it don't mean that that was Satan. 
Now, I'm, I'm almost finished. You know, I have to thank Allah because I, I really haven't been feeling that well. And, you know, I, he, he let me get through last night. And I got another day tomorrow, but I'm feeling so good at this moment. <laughs> Now, I'll try you with something of fear, hunger, loss of property. Now, I tell you, when you own something that is useful to you, it really hurts to lose it. You know, I have been given wonderful gifts, and a brother gave me a beautiful Rolex watch, white gold with diamonds, and I had it along with my messenger ring and, and um, some beautiful cufflinks that I bought in Saudi Arabia and other things, and I had it in my bag. and. As I, either when I was going through the airport, they saw it and took it, or, or somebody close by got to it, but I lost all this jewelry. Well, you know, I've never lost anything like that, and it hurt, you know. So I understand what loss of property is, you know, because you like your things. And when somebody steals something from you, it's like violating you. You know what I mean? So I came here to Atlanta, and you know what? As, as, um, as I lost these things, it hurt, but I said, well, Allah, you know, the, the one thing they can't steal is the jewels of knowledge that you've given, so I won't wear jewelry anymore. i just go on, you know? So I came here to Atlanta, and last night, a brother came to my room. He said, Minister, I heard that you lost some of your jewelry. He said, try this. And here, this beautiful, all diamond, crescent and star ring. This diamond's all the way around on white gold. He said, try this on. He said, he saw it in a store. And it's a perfect fit. So, wait a minute. See, when you lose something that you don't worship. Well, Father, you know, I'm sorry I lost it, but you're the best Noah. But I thank God that I still have the jewels of knowledge and, and, and they bling bling more than anything else. You know? <laughs> so, 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 so when the brother put it on my finger, I was a little embarrassed to tell you the truth, but boy, is it beautiful. So I thank the brother, thank him so much. But I thank Allah because he put it in brother's heart to do that, which is to tell me, soon you may lose a lot more. But don't worry about what you lose because I'm going to try you with loss of property. But give good news to those who are patient and steadfast under trial. Then he says, I'm going to try you with loss of life. Who are sane, love our lives, no matter how difficult life may be at a certain time for us, we love our lives. And we love the lives of our loved ones. 
And sometimes we think because we're trying to please God that no misfortune should come into our lives. And all of a sudden you get a phone call that there was an accident. There was a car crash. There was an accident on the job. And somebody you love has passed away. It could be your child who contracts some illness and like a child that's running out on the basketball court and all of a sudden falls to the ground and they don't know what happened to the child but he dies. Like the little girl down in Florida, nine years old. And this dog of a human goes in and takes her out of her home, out of her bed, and buries her 150 yards away from her house. Can you imagine the pain and the anguish of that family? <coughs> How many black women are losing their children? People just snatching them and running away with them, selling them. Do you know what it's like to be a mother and go into a supermarket to shop and turn your back and your little one is gone? That's pain. That's a trial of great magnitude. And God tells Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I'm going to try you with loss of life. He lost his dear wife, Khadija. He had children from his wives. And every time they produced one, it died. And then he said, diminution of fruit. Sometimes you have a lot. And then all of a sudden, for no explained reason, you see things diminishing. Your mosque is full. Your church is full. Your house is full of joy. And all of a sudden, things start diminishing. And you may not have an answer for that. Your health may start going down. And you may not have an answer for that as it was with Job. But the thing that made Job so great and a study for us was that no matter what his friends said, no matter what his wife said, he said, I'm going to wait until my change comes. Because there is no trial that you have where there's not a change coming. If you can hold on through your trial and not break faith with God though you're afraid though you're hungry though you've lost some property though lives have been lost and fruit has been diminished but if you can hold on then give good news to those who are patient and steadfast under trial. So in my conclusion, as I thought on this subject this morning, I thought on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I thought of Jesus, and I thought of my beloved teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. 
Prophet Muhammad, though he was the most noble of human beings, was tried severely. He was tried by hunger. He was tried by fear. He was tried by loss of property. He was tried by loss of life. He was tried by loss of a diminution of fruit. But he was patient and steadfast. And God gave him victory over not only his enemies, but gave him victory over those things that he tried him with. See, when you get a victory over fear, a victory over hunger, a victory over loss of property and loss of life, where you can sustain all of that and keep your faith. You become a super human being reflecting the divine. And because you've been faithful over little, he will make you ruler over much. Now watch this. To my Christian family, see, you love Jesus and so do we. I loved the man so much till I asked God to make me like him. Now listen to me. Here's a man that they were after him before he was born. That while his mother was carrying him in the womb, Herod had sent out a decree to kill all boy babies from two years old and under, so she had to flee and hide. While he was growing in her womb, she was running and hiding. And when a woman is fashioning life and is running and hiding from death, she's afraid. She's insecure. So she has to cry out to a superior power to uphold her. And in her crying out, it goes into the womb and it fashions a child that will seek God under all circumstances of his life. Now look at this. Look at this now. She flees into Egypt <laughs> so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt have I called my son. He grows up in Egypt. He's a good student. He learns well, but at a certain point, he has to go back to Palestine to speak and prophesy to the children of Israel. He goes back. They hate him. They hate his word. Oh, yeah. They hated him without a cause. He knew what it was like to be scorned, to be rebuked, to be hated, to be lied on, to be conspired against. None of that caused his character to waver. He knew fear. Because in the garden, he went to praying and sweat was dropping off his brow. And he said, Father, 
pass this cup away from me. I don't like this cup. I'm afraid. I don't want to drink this cup. But whatever you will, Father. God damn, boy. Even though I don't want the cup. But if you, Father, want me to drink the cup, then I'll drink it, Father. What kind of cup is it, son? To be betrayed by those close to me. That they may bring me into the house of my enemies to crucify me. But Father, if this is what you want, whatever you bid me say, that's what I say. Whatever you bid me to do, that I do. They brought him to court. But before they brought him to court, you know how the FBI and them question you, you know? And one of the scriptures that I read, he was sitting and they were questioning him. So you're a prophet, huh? And they smacked him upside his head. Say, well, which one of us hit you then? But he took it. He was waiting till his change comes. He was afraid, but he challenged fear. He knew hunger because he had fasted for 40 days. He knew loss of property and loss of life. Diminution of fruit. But good news was for the one who was patient and steadfast under trial. So when they took him to the cross, according to the book, and nailed him. Stripped him. Put a sign up. Jesus. King. Of the Jews. That means. Leader of the niggers. And they nailed him. Pierced him in his side. Put a crown of thorns on his head. He asked for water. They gave him vinegar. And he hung there being spat upon and ridiculed. But then darkness came. <laughs> He said, Father, into your hands I have committed my spirit. And the last three words he spoke, it is finished. What did he mean? I have run the good race. I have fought the good fight now is laid up for me a crown I did what you sent me into the world to do it is finished I paid the price it is finished now I come to my teacher The Honorable Elijah Muhammad When Master Farad Muhammad left him, he was crying. 
He told me he watched Master Farad Muhammad walk down the street and he was weeping because he said the master told him you don't need me anymore and he said oh yes I do he said oh no you don't because the master had come because in that man was enough to deliver a whole people but he needed to be quickened to life and once he was quickened to life the power that God had created in him would begin working when Master Farad left he was alone with a mission to raise 40 million of us from the dead. Within a year, hypocrisy arose because they thought he was trying to make something of himself and teaching what Master Farad had not taught him about himself because he said that that man that came and taught him was the second coming of the Jesus, the Son of Man. So the hypocrites among the followers wanted to kill him. And as it is written in, I think it's the book of Acts, where some of those who wanted to kill Paul said that they would eat a grain of rice a day until he was dead. And they went to kill Elijah Muhammad and he began running to cities and everywhere he ran he dropped a seed. Milwaukee became Moss number three. He came to Washington. It became mosque number four. He studied in the Congressional Library where he studied and found books that Master Farad had given him to study where he knew the exact time of the black man being brought into America. It was not 1619, it was 1555 on a ship named Jesus captained by one Sir John Hawkins. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad began to study for his assignment. <clears throat> After seven years of running, the Congressional, I mean the uh, President of the United States issued the executive order. He went to prison. He was arrested in Washington, D.C. He was in jail there, then sent to Milan, Michigan where he stayed in prison for five years. When the war was over, they let him out. But he came before the judges, and the judges said to him, trying to teach black people Islam is like putting pants on an elephant. And he said, Your Honor, I got one pants leg on already. <laughs> When they had him confined, <clears throat> the FBI was questioning him. And one man took a gun and put it to his head. He said, I ought to blow your so-and-so brains out. He said, if it pleases Allah, you will. But if it don't please Allah, you won't. He didn't back down. I don't follow no punk leader. I follow a man and the best of men. He never backed down. They said, go on, Elijah, and teach your people. While in prison, Malcolm X, who was Malcolm Little, had a vision while he was in jail of Master Farad Muhammad. Go read his life. One of Elijah Muhammad's followers went there and gave him the teachings 
And then Malcolm read everything in the prison library, starting with the dictionary. He came out a monster. Nobody could handle Brother Malcolm. And it was in the year 1955 on Savior's Day that I was playing in a nightclub in Chicago. And I saw one of my friends while I was in a taxi cab and I told the cab driver, stop. I ran to my friend from Boston in Chicago. And I said, man, I'm glad to run into you. You know what I mean? I want you to come on down and catch my show. I was playing at the Blue Angel nightclub. I wanted him to catch my show, but he wanted me to meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he said, uh, Gene, they called me Gene then. He said, Gene, uh, we're having a national convention. You know, your uncle is right around the corner. I said, my uncle? We went around the corner. My uncle was in the, the grocery store. And the messenger was in there too. But he just said, my uncle. So my uncle came out. We embraced. And he said, you know, Elijah Muhammad will be speaking on uh, Sunday. Would you be our guest? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Y'all going to come check out my show? <laughs> They never came to check out my show. But I sure went to check out the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, as God is my witness, my little wife was down in the front with my first child, Betsy Jean, in her arms. And I didn't know this, but the messenger told him, sit me in the balcony. And he sat Captain Yusuf Shah, one of the greatest captains in the nation of Islam. Man that taught me how to be a man. Those of us who've been around a while, we know what it took to get us to where we are. We know those who had a hand in shaping us into what and who we are today. And we can't be true unless we're grateful for those who gave us the word and those who nurtured us and those who taught us how to be soldiers. And when I heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad spit, split a few verbs, and I was an English student, you know, I said, man, this cat can't even talk. And he looked right up in my face. And he said, brother, I didn't have a chance to go to school as you did. He said, uh, when I got there, brother, the door was closing. He said, but don't you pay no attention to how I'm saying it. You pay attention to what I'm saying. And then you take it and put it in that fine language that you know. He said that 50 years ago, February, and that's exactly what I'm doing today. Oh. I'm almost finished. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad 
suffered much and worked hard day in and day out for us. I was blessed to have Brother Malcolm as my first minister. I don't think I could have had a better teacher than Brother Malcolm. Regardless to how things ended, I am what I am because Malcolm paid a price that I could be who and what I am. I'll tell you more about that at another time. But Brother Malcolm was my teacher. And I tried always to be a good student. I was in show business. So being in show business, you love applause. That's what you work for. So you can preach the word, but sometimes your preaching is tainted because you want the roar of the crowd and, and the applause of the people. But I was anointed with his spirit but I had to grow out of show business into God's business. Mm. I loved Brother Malcolm more than words can say because I never had a father and my big brother, Alvin, was only a year and a half older than I. And we didn't have the kind of relationship that would be nurturing. But my uncle and my minister, Malcolm, were the men in my life and Captain Yusuf Shah and the FOI. And I want to say this because the mosque is a womb. Listen. And when the new life comes, it reaches like the first cell of life to cling to the walls of the uterus. It's looking for a firm resting place. But if the mosque is cold and the love is not there, the new life has no firm resting place. So there's a miscarriage or an abortion. But I was blessed. I came into an environment where there was so much love. So much love. I remember my first night in the FOI. My brother, Captain Yusuf. We have a new FOI tonight. Brother Louis 2X. And I came before the FOI to make my speech. And I said, and I looked into the faces of the brothers. And I had never seen that much love in the eyes of black men for a black man. I'd never seen it. <clears throat> and as I began to speak, I began to weep. 
And so, naturally, you come into the world, you know what I mean, they looking for a man, you know what I mean? Right. You're in the FOI, man, you're in the man's class, right. and I'm in the man's class crying, you know? Yeah. I said, well, what the hell is this? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but babies do come in the world crying. And I said on my first night in the FOI, quote, I'm going to take this word to every nook and every cranny of the United States of America. And my word is my bond. All along my 50 years, I have been tried. And when Brother Malcolm turned on the Honorable Elijah Muhammad over his misunderstanding of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's personal domestic life, My brother stumbled. When he fell, he and I had a conversation in his 1963 Blue Oldsmobile, which is in Malcolm X College in Chicago. We sat in that car. And Brother Malcolm said to me, Brother Lewis, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. He said, my enemies will be your enemies. He knew that I was going to replace him as a national representative. I had no knowledge, but he knew. And he knew that his life was to be an example for me. I never wanted my brother's place. I loved him to the point where I would have given my life at any time to protect his life because I saw his life as more valuable than my life because of his connection to and representation of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I did not know what the future would hold for me. I'm going to tell you a few little things, a few little things that will tell you something about what we've been talking about, about trials. I had just come in the mosque and I was playing in a nightclub downtown New York in Greenwich Village. I think I received my ex in October of 1955 and one month later in November I was playing downtown and when I came up to our little Temple Number no. 7 luncheonette on 120th Street and Lenox Avenue to have a bowl of bean soup a brother rushed up to me and said Louis hey man Word came down from the messenger today. Y'all got 30 days to get out of music or get out of the temple. Think about it. Music was my life. Listen up. I tried working day jobs, but that didn't fit me. 
I ain't lying. I could sing. I could dance. I could do lots of things. But working days wasn't one of them. <laughs> so, so now, man, I got up from my bowl of soup. And I walked out. And I took about 20 paces. And as God is my witness, I said, I can live without music, but I can't live without the truth. As I turned to walk back to the restaurant, Yusuf Shah was running to me. And he was angry that this brother had broken the news to me because he wanted to handle me with skill and make sure that I would make it, you know. And when he walked up to me, I said, it's all right, Captain. I've made up my mind. I'll leave music. I had 30 days, so I want to work as much as I could and get as much money as I could and <laughs> take care of my wife and my children. On the last day, I was playing upstate New York in the uh, Catskill Mountains in a resort called the Neverly Country Club. It's 11 spelled backwards. And I said, well, I'm going to get it all out of my system tonight. <laughs> so I took my violin. I played jazz. I played classics. I put that down. I sang ballads, light classics, blues, Calypso, Mambo, danced, told jokes. I was emptying it all out because I ain't coming back this way no more. I got down in my dressing room and this very dignified gangster looking white man came. He said, uh, I've never seen a man so talented in so many different fields. He said, uh, do you have a manager? I said, no, sir. He said, well, I manage Pearl Bailey and Billy Daniels. Those of you young people, you won't know them, but the elders here no, Pearl Bailey was a giant, and so was Billy Daniels. And he said, if you sign with me, listen to me good now. If you sign with me, he said, you will be in the stable of, of Pearl Bailey and Billy Daniels, and I will start you with $500 a week. Now, $500 a week in $1955, that wasn't bad. So he said, meet me downtown New York. I'll have my lawyer, and uh, we'll have dinner, and we'll sign the contract tomorrow. I said, yes, sir. I had no intention. But I did say, yes, sir. So I went home. I'm through now. And I laid down in my bed. And that night, I saw a vision of two doors. One door had success written over it. And I could look in it. And there was a mound of diamonds and gold. And then the other door had Islam over it and a black veil. And I was asked to choose which door. So I'm being tested. I could see the gold and the diamonds, but I didn't know where Islam was going to take me. 
but I chose the door of Islam. Now listen, listen, listen. Now I had to work days. And I was the baddest, clumsiest worker you ever saw. I got fired from every job. The first job I had was washing dishes. A brother got me that job. And I was washing the dishes. And I didn't do good even washing dishes. Then the enemy said, uh, uh, come on, uh, uh, Lewis, uh, peel these potatoes. I ain't never peeled a potato in my life. I didn't tell the man I don't know how to peel potatoes. I started peeling half the potato <laughs> gone with the skin. The man looked, he said, damn. He said, all right, mop the floor. And he gave me this mop and the mop looked like it was so heavy. And I ain't never mop, you know, like, like, you know, the professional when you swing that thing. And that man looked at me. They worked me so hard that day, giving, running and giving coffee to the neighbors and whatnot. I overslept the next day. So I called the man and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I overslept, but I'm on my way. He said, don't bother. Just, just come and pick up your money for yesterday. I ain't lying, I got fired from every job. But here's the point. I had a wife. I had now two children. I wasn't going to steal. And since I couldn't do music anymore, I had to find a way. And the last job that I had, one of the jobs that I had in Boston when I moved back, paid $45 a week. And they took out 90 cents, you know, for taxes and Social Security or whatever. And I came home with $44, brother. And I never missed a week paying charity. And my little wife would wash my shirts on a scrub board because I couldn't afford no washing machine, had no automobile, had to walk miles to the mosque. You ain't been through nothing that I haven't been through before you. And never knew a meltdown. I sold papers in the snow and ice. I was a captain and I led my men in the field. I took abuse and scorn from members of my family. But I kept on moving. I've been tried. And after Brother Malcolm was gone, The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, I'll never teach another minister like I taught Malcolm until I have thoroughly tried him. And he looked at me, letting me know, you ain't getting no free ride here, buddy. And when I stand in front of you today, he, he's making me into himself. I'm not the man that you grew up with. 
come a long, long way from that. This man you have to get acquainted with. You can call me Lewis. You can call me Gene, if you know me that long. You can call me brother. You can call me minister. But you don't know me. I'm a lot different than what you perceive. And sometime in your ignorance, you disrespect my growth. Now I close. You all Christians say you love Jesus. But you don't want to follow him. It ain't about singing songs. It ain't about standing up talking about how great Jesus is. The heavens and the earth testifies to his greatness. He did not ask you to worship him. He asked us to follow him. He said, if any man would be my disciple, he must first deny himself. Pick up his cross. In other words, you can't carry Jesus' cross, but you got one. And you don't even want to pick up yours. You are like Frederick Douglass says, you want the ocean, but you don't want its awful roar. You are people that want to get to heaven but don't want to pay the price. You are people that want your enemy out of the way, but you're not willing to sacrifice to make yourself into the man and the woman that would make your enemy flee. You don't want to be rebuked and scorned by your people. You don't want to be lied on. Right. Who does? But if you don't want the cross, then you'll never wear the crown. So you can run and you can hide. But God is calling you. And do men think that they will be left alone and not be tried. The Masons say, I've been tried, seldom denied, willing to be tried again. Well, I think that I've said yes, sir. <laughs> what I wanted you to hear and wait, wait. I want you to go home and reflect on your life personally. Those of us who ducked out and ran from our cross and pursued a life that would gratify you on some level, but you compromised yourself in the process. Then I want you to go home and do this. I've been fighting you, Allah. I've been doing my own thing. And it got me into all this trouble. My hands are up. I have no more fight with you. You are the greatest. 
You are the greatest. And I'm ready now to humble myself and pray. And bear witness that you are God. And beside you there is none. And if you believe in Jesus, then ask God to strengthen your steps that you may follow in his path. And his was not an easy life. And when you bring righteousness into this filthy, decadent world, it's not an easy road. But what will make thee know what the uphill road is? It is to free a slave. I want to thank Brother Sharif, Minister Sharif. Where's Minister? I want to thank Brother Sharif. I sent him here for 90 days as a trial to see if he, with your help, could turn Atlanta around. And when I come here, and I see what you've done to transform this former theater into a beautiful house, cleaned up, but a house is not a home until the people in that house have love for one another. And what I saw when I slipped in here late one night, people were in the mosque, children were here, and there was so much love. You say, but he's, he's driving us hard. You say, you say, you know, he shouldn't, he shouldn't dr 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 drive us like that. But if he lets you do as you please, you would do nothing. You remind me of the song in Porgy and Bess. I think it's from Porgy and Bess. I got plenty of nothing, and nothing is plenty for me. I got my gal. She ain't nothing. <laughs> he pushed you. He cajoled you cajoled you, he exhorted you, he rebuked you, and look at what you are doing. The city feels your presence now, and soon this place will be so small as it already is coming like that. I told the minister, we'll have two, three meetings. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. <laughs> Soon you'll have a beautiful house bigger than this with yes. school. Yes, sir. You'll have businesses. Yes, sir. You begin to show the world economic and spiritual development. Yes. Don't forget that you will be tried. Yes. And watch out for the spider who's always spinning a web.
to take away from you your soul. The devil is mad. And we glad, glad, glad. Because I think we snatched back some of the souls that he thought he had. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Come on, Atlanta. This is the Southern Region. Come on, Atlanta. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in Atlanta, Georgia. Go ahead and give him a round of applause. Let him feel your love. This is Moss number 15 in Atlanta, Georgia, showing our love and support for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in Atlanta.